Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast Season 14, Episode 129. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Wednesday. Steelers Nation getting ready for Rookie Minicamp, which will take place on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So looking forward to seeing the rookie class and getting some Steelers back out on the practice field. Do have to start, though, Dave, with an apology, something I do want to mention to you on, on Monday. It was a, a big story that I didn't get to to address, Dave. Where do you come in on the, I, on the I, Kendrick I, Lamar-Drake I, battle? I accept. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you come in? We have to know. I, I don't know. I, I'd love to know if you have thoughts on this story, on this Kendrick-Drake beef. It's all Greek, man. I try to stay up with these kids and all like that, man, and, and to know what's going on. But I don't have a I don't have a clue what any of that means or I mean, I, I guess I know what disses are and uh, I, I don't have a clue. I don't know who said what. I don't know what not any of that means. Uh, <laughs> I, I am absolutely clueless. I can tell you uh, uh, what happened in the. Uh, uh, Bon Jovi documentary, the four part series. <laughs> <laughs> that is, <laughs> remember the Bon Jovi divide. back, back in, you know, uh, m- many moons ago. And yeah, uh, I, I, I can tell you what happened in that. And, uh, I can tell you what happened on, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the Disney Walt Disney episode of, uh, of, uh, on the history channel last night that I taped and watched that. But, uh, Man, I, I, I have lost my mojo, baby. I'm not, I'm not cool anymore. <laughs> uh, what, what, what did happen? Do you know anything about any of that? I, I, I know I'm officially old and I've never been cool. And certainly I'm not cool now because everyone's talking about it. And I just don't know what's going on. I just, I, it's all over my head. I tell you, I grew up in a, uh, here we go down off the track. This is all on you. So, yep. uh, I grew up in Saturday night live generation, obviously, you know, uh, and you know, on, on, on through to what the late seventies on into the eighties and obviously nineties and all. And man, you know, growing up you know, Saturday night live was kind of, you know, must see TV as much as you could, you, 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 you could remember to watch it. And if you're around to watch it, those kind of things there, uh, you know, for the last several years now, the, even the, the host, unless it's an ex, you know, Saturday night live, uh, uh, you know, character, I mean, or, 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 or cast member there or, or a famous movie star or something. I have no clue who any of these, <laughs> uh, host are or musical guest or, or anything along that nature now. And, and man, I, I mean, I'm old, I'm not like ancient old. I mean, I'm 50, what am I 56 now, you know, but, uh, just, just sign of the times, I guess you kind of lose touch with, 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 with that kind of stuff probably doesn't help that I'm buried and just Steelers stuff for 20 hours a day, right. uh, uh, on, on, on top of it there. But I mean, you're on, you're not, I mean, you're, you're just barely over 30 and you, you're having trouble staying in touch with the kids nowadays. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know what's happening with all who who's winning that disc battle. Do we know? I'm pretty sure Kendrick Lamar is, uh, okay. destroying Drake seems to be the, uh, the consensus right now. Okay. All right. Well, we got that out of the way. So, uh, <laughs> uh, mo- moving on, Alex, we have to break some news to some people, uh, today. Uh, everybody, I hope everybody, you know, pull over to the side of the road here. D- you'll do what you, whatever you have to do here. Uh, folks, uh, Tyler Boyd's not coming to the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> <laughs> Pour one out for those chances. I, they were honestly probably realistic early in the off season, but post draft, they were just weren't going to happen. Pittsburgh did not need another slot receiver. Uh, it does take another veteran receiver off the market. Boyd signing a one year deal with the Tennessee Titans, reuniting with uh, uh, Brian Callahan, the head coach in Tennessee. He was his OC in Cincinnati for the last several years. But yeah, that story at least it's at least there's a conclusion to it. I'm just happy to like start wrapping up some of these names we've been talking about for so long. Well, there's not many names left to wrap up at at at, at this point. And look, uh, the whole Tyler Boyd, 
the most interesting aspect of Tyler Boyd. Uh, well, there, I guess there's two interesting aspects to Tyler Boyd signing with the Titans. Uh, for one of them being, should have seen this one coming uh, with the link to the uh, to the head coach there, obviously being the former uh, uh, offensive coordinator in Cincinnati. So that that's one. Second is anytime you see a contract like that. Uh, 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 break on Twitter uh, having to use the words up to $4.5 million. Uh, it, it, it makes you really wonder what the base value of this thing is and what the incentives are. Look, I mean, that's that's a cheap deal for being honest with each other, uh, uh, regardless of what the incentives are on that. Uh, one year up to $4.5 million. You know, I know people are already tweeting you, why couldn't the Steers have done that? Well, the Steers very well, very easily could have done that. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I think you hit it on as well, too. You know, coming out of the draft and getting uh, getting a player like Roman Wilson, who, who you know, most of us view more of a slot player and Tyler Boyd being more of a slot kind of guy there. I mean, you're, you're kind of duplicating yourself uh, there. You know, obviously a more experienced guy in Tyler Boyd there. But I mean, if they, if 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 the Steelers weren't going to, you know, uh, spend up to four point five million dollars on a guy like Tyler Boyd, I mean, how how you know what was even the offer prior to the draft for a guy like that? Sure, you have to wonder assuming about assuming there assuming there was one, you know. Right. And there's been some mixed reporting on that because initially there was reporters from Steel's Beat Guys, other uh, you know, outlets that said money was the issue. But then I know at some point Jeremy Fowler <laughs> said no hard offer was made to Boyd. And considering what he signed for, it doesn't sound like money would have been the big sticking point in any sort of deal or potential deal with Pittsburgh. Right. Uh any offer may be that this team, that the Steelers may have made to Tyler Boyd, obviously wasn't more than four point five million. I don't think. Uh, fact, fact, it probably, you know, the Steelers probably wanted to try to do a two year deal on him anyway. You know, mm -hmm. uh, for I don't know, maybe something around two, two and a half million or something like that. And, uh, we're, we're all speculating at this point when it comes to that, but uh, it just looking back at it now in the rearview mirror. It just doesn't seem like the Steelers really had much interest in him other than maybe X amount of cheap price, you know? Right. Maybe looking for a bit more youth and just guys that can be hopefully more dynamic and Roman Wilson can hopefully provide that. I knew we've talked about it plenty, but you had written about it yesterday. I think even on the heels of the Boyd signing in terms of the free agent options at wide receiver, it looks very limited. Pittsburgh does not seem to have interest in Zay Jones, who's visiting with the Cowboys. I think the Cardinals he's visited or will visit as well. And so he's working his way around the league in Pittsburgh as of now is not reportedly shown any interest in him. So seems unlikely Zay Jones will sign in Pittsburgh. So in terms of the free agent market, again, it's very, very thin out there. Alex, I'm going to read off some names. All right. And, and as I go down the list uh, of, of, of names here, there's nine of them. I want you to, this is going to be like a uh, no whammy, you know, uh, mm. it's like press your luck. So uh, you make sure you try to stop the, uh, stop the, 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 the cursor uh, when you hear a name that uh, you would view maybe as a significant playmaker. Uh, <laughs> Can I be the guy that memorized the board and cheat? Well, kind of cheated, quote unquote, and won have, all that money. Remember that? Ha guy? Have at it. Right. Have at it. Have at it. All right. Here we go. Uh, Alex, you're next up on uh, press your significant playmaker luck. <laughs> Wait, should uh, I say should I say stop whenever I get yeah, you get to a name yeah. that is interesting? Is that yeah. the criteria? Okay. Right. You're right. You say stop, and okay. then you know, might 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 have to yell out no whammy or something. All <laughs> right. Uh, Michael Thomas, Zay Jones, Hunter Renfro, Russell Gage, Marquez Valdez Scantling. Hello, is this thing still on? <laughs> My silence is deafening. Randall Cobb, Marquise Goodwin. Julio Jones, Robbie Chosen, test, test, test. You still there? <laughs> Mike is turned on. You didn't mute yourself, did you? Uh, do I, I? I don't need. Do I need to go through those nine names again? <laughs> no. I, I, the, the the point is, is that am I am, I, am I missing here. anybody on there? Is there anybody not on that list that that I mean, that, that 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 should be on a 
uh, one of these type of list. That's probably the list there. The, again, the best name is probably Michael Thomas. Uh, the question would just be about his overall health and availability and a, a little bit on cost as well. But the first name you read off is, I, I, I guess, if you, if you, it's like when you do the eye test and both are terrible options and you got to choose you know, which one is slightly better, that's a slightly better option. Mm, okay. Uh, man. I, and look, th- it's not like this all, this list all of a sudden got to this. I mean, it's slowly been bleeding. I mean, and, and even, you know, even include the last couple that have, who are the last couple that have signed what Odell Beckham Jr. And Tyler Boyd. And who, who was the one before, uh, DJ uh, Chark uh, for D- the Chargers. Yeah. Uh, DJ Chark. I mean, were any of those guys real needle movers to you? Well, like I said, I thought Shark was somebody who was who would fit well with what Pittsburgh was looking for. But obviously, we're not talking about super high end caliber guys. It'd still be, you know, we, you would not call that a needle mover signing. All right. Uh, and 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 this has been the case for 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 a couple of weeks now. Anyway. Any any needle mover, any significant playmaker that this team were uh, were to potentially get at this point has got to come via a trade, right? I mean, I mean, and that's, that's really been, that's really been the case for, you know, two weeks prior to the draft, right? Sure. I mean, if you want, in terms of that, that splash, that significant playmaker, then that is going to have to be via trade. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Why we, we talked uh, on the last show about Callaway. We're, we're, we're trying to go through the quality of the Ritz cracker. Right, 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 right now, you know, uh, versus great value and all like, is that a saltine? Is that a Ritz and all like that? We're talking about Callaway. We're talking about uh, 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 you've already written up the futures report on Denzel Mims, but way back in February, mm-hmm. uh, Van Jefferson, uh, Quez Watkins, uh, you know, obviously you got, you know, a, a quality guy in, in, in George Pickens at the top of that thing. And now obviously you've got, uh, uh, Roman Wilson in the room, but I mean, he's a rookie. You got, you know, Calvin Austin, the third, who's we we still want to see more of what he actually is, uh, at, at this point, what is your, you know, assuming that this is what you have to work with, with a room, with a wide receiver room. And, and, and assuming we kind of have an idea what, what they want to do offensively as far as personnel grouping, scheme, yada, yada, is this enough of a wide receiver room? How worried are, are you about it? I still feel like it's a, it's a missing puzzle piece. I had written a couple of weeks ago. It may not be one of the middle puzzle pieces that you absolutely need for the whole thing to look right, but it's still one of those outside exterior you know, on the edges, puzzle pieces where you still feel it's it's incomplete if you're missing and you're looking for that puzzle piece. So I, I just, again, I don't want to go into the season in November. Your offense is struggling. God forbid Pickens gets hurt. And you sit there and say, man, we just if we just had this one other receiver. Right. We had acquired that guy. You don't want to have that regret in a year where you're trying to get this offense to at least be average and hopefully better than that. But even average would be a welcome sight in Pittsburgh. I mean, it's felt for, and we've had this conversation. It feels like they just need that one more player in that room, right? They do. They do. Now, you had written a little bit about Traylon Burks in Tennessee, and with Boyd signing with the Titans, it feels like Burks is probably on his way out in some capacity. I bet. I don't know about you, but that to me, that's, and I wrote this yesterday, to me, that's more more project than it is prospect. I does agree. That, I does, w- that, does that excite? I mean, no. Uh, Feel free to tell me if tell me I'm wrong here. And there are probably people screaming at their uh, podcast machines right now, saying, "Dave, you're crazy." That oh, is it just because it's something new that that people are getting excited about him? It's uh, it, it's just a different it's a different flavor in the in 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 the ice cream bin or what? But I you know I've looked at his tape. Obviously, it's not too, too we're not too far removed from the pre draft process uh, with him, but. I, I, I don't find myself getting excited about him at all. I don't either. I didn't think coming out of college, he was a great separator. I think those big guys that can't separate typically struggle in the NFL. Denzel Mims being one of them and Burks now seemingly being the next. Um, so, but it is a different name. There's pedigree to it. The cost probably would not be expensive with a new head coach in there. So I understand why he's being mentioned. 
he's played on the outside. He can play in the slot as well, but not somebody that I think is is really going to do much for this offense. I mean, I, I knew people would ask about him when I wrote that article, so I included him in there because that seems to be the flavor of the of the half week, if you will. Uh, but I mean, what about a player that has 49 total receptions for 665 yards and one touchdown on 84 targets in his first two NFL seasons gets people excited as a potential significant playmaker. I, I, I'm, I'm struggling with it. Sure. The, the issue is we're trying to find names that are plausible to acquire. I mean, maybe they go out there and get DK Metcalf, but I think the idea of Burks being available is much more likely than the idea of Metcalf being available, even though Metcalf is obviously the superior player. All right, uh, not naming Iuk, uh, not naming uh, Debo Samuel, not naming any of the 49ers guys, and, and for the moment, not naming guys like uh, Cortland Sutton or DK Metcalf. Who else is out there uh, that would be a, you know, that you could potentially maybe even theorized trading for that would be a, a needle mover. Now I mentioned, you know, because if I didn't, if I, if you write an article like this and you don't mention one guy, all the comments are going to be about is why didn't you mention this one guy? You know, sure. uh, you know how it works. We've done this long mm-hmm. enough. Uh, but I, I mentioned, you know, Terry McLaurin of, 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 of the Washington commanders and Chris Godwin, two players that were really, I, I, I really like, but, or at, at this stage of their career, uh, are you know, and fit and 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 you know, uh, scheme and all like that, or, or e- either one of those two guys. And once again, we're fabricating th- the idea that the, either one of those guys are even for sale, you know. Mm-hmm. But but to either one of those two guys move the needle for you, and if not those two guys, and if not Burks, who else? is out there that could be a significant playmaker. I mean, I think once the summer starts, camp begins, I'll kind of look through the list with a, a closer lens, depending on maybe some someone in camp stars and that makes a veteran expendable. But you could mention Darius Slayton of the Giants. He wants a new contract. There's been some negotiations back and forth, and that's a guy with some big playability. He's a 4-3 type of guy when he came out. He's got some size. That, that's a name you could, I think, at least argue. I mean, does that move the needle much for you? I, I think it's similar to a DJ Shark, a bit younger, I believe. But, you know, it's not somebody that's going to be a high volume type of player, but hopefully can, you know, create some big plays downfield. I wonder what's going on with his contract here. He had, what, a roster bonus due. Uh, he's got a, I have to research into his contract because he got a base salary. It looks like a $2.5 million dollars. But he's got a cap number of eight point one five million. So I wonder what's uh looks like if they cut him, there'd be dead money of four point three five million. So they must have they must have gave him a uh a roster bonus of I guess four point three. It must be a little bit more than that, uh out, out there as well, too. They don't have this contract broken down on over the cap the way they traditionally do. They just have a base salary and a cap number on him. So I'm going to have to research his, uh, but I mean, if they've got, if they, if, if, if they only save what it looks like they save 3.8 million, but let's, let's look at trade post June 1st. Uh, looks like they would save, that roster bonus must no. He's got a roster bonus, some sort of one on March 18th that's already paid to him. So they've got mm-hmm. some money invested in him already. There might there must be some other roster bonus that has something else that hasn't matured yet or something because he's only got a base salary of 2.5. Maybe There's, a per game roster bonus. Or um, something? Yeah, I, I, I don't. It says another 4.5 million in incentives and escalators or something like that. Lord, the Steelers hate those. Uh, they right. try to obviously maybe try to work him out, but he's only under contract. I mean, what are you even going to give up for a guy like that? And, 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 and what would the giants even be looking for? It doesn't feel like they have to move him, you know? No, they don't have to. I, again, I think that's still pretty unlikely, but if you want to just mention some names in terms of guys looking for new contracts that might create a reason to be traded, 
that's one to consider. What does the rest of their depth chart even even look like right now, the Giants? Yeah, I really hadn't spent a lot of time looking at it. I'm just top of my head, some names that are out there in terms of, okay, you can at least make a case for why this guy would want out or why a team would want to trade him. Of course, they took Malik Neighbors, six overall. They got Jalen Hyatt. They drafted third round last year. He's a, another vertical type of receiver. Uh, they got ex-stealer Miles Boykin to play special teams for them. Isaiah McKenzie. And there's a couple of options. It's not an incredibly deep receiver room, though. Yeah, it feels like. I mean, wh- wh- why are you going to take a? I can understand if you got if if he's hollering to get out or whatnot. But I mean, uh, and they got Wendell Wendell Robinson over there as well too. I mean, I, mean, I can it, see it. If Hyatt and Neighbors are your top two guys, that could make somebody like Slayton more expendable. Okay. All right. Anybody else that we have not discussed? I, again, I'd have to go through the list. I think we've touched on a lot of the most plausible or at least right. interesting names. I can't help but but keep going back to wondering if Sutton or, or, or DK Metcalf might end up being the target here post June first. If if indeed there is a target. I, I I've gone back and, and uh Zapruder filmed uh, uh had a Zapruder breakdown of, of everything Omar Khan has said almost this off season and 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 and, and you know kind of try to contextualize that in my head. I, I think that they're still trying to make something happen somewhere. Sure. Sure. I think they are too, but it takes two to tango. I don't think they have a dance partner right now. Okay. Uh, I will tell you this though. I've become a, uh, I'm, I'm becoming a uh, Seattle Seahawks cap of uh, <laughs> aficionado here. Uh, let me, it's hard for you to even answer. It's hard for any of us to answer this question, but, but, when you have a team like the Seahawks that are that are up against it as much as they are right now, uh, with the salary cap, why you suppose? Why do you suppose they are nickel and diming this thing as far as okay, we got it. We just signed our first round draft pick. We got to clear some cap room to get that under the under the cap. Let's take uh, an RFA that we tendered and cut his cut his knees out from underneath, which that's dirty pool, by the way. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I, uh, nobody understands the, the financial part of the business, maybe as much as I do following all these contracts. Uh, but that's dirty. That's dirty pool to, 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 to restricted tender a guy, um, uh, wait until, wait until after the draft and then basically threaten to, 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 to yank that out from underneath him if he doesn't agree to lower the salary. Sure. I mean, if you just want agents to hate you, then right. go ahead and do that. Yeah, and, I, and, I, that, and that's essentially what happened with Michael Jackson uh, 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 with them, and that's how they cleared a little bit of cap room to at least get their UDFAs and 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 their first round draft pick uh, under contract. But but now that that smoke's cleared, I mean, they're back up against it. What what I'm getting at is if you you know we talked about how DK Metcalf is. And look, I'm not trying to turn this into Seahawks Depot. I'm just trying to see if, if how how much of a legitimate option, you know, a guy like DK DK Metcalf could be. And for them to clear cap, there's not many guys that they can go to and get restructures done on. But DK Metcalf is one of them, as we we previously mentioned here. I, I I guess what I'm getting at is is if he's a candidate, you know, you're going to need that room at some point. Why wouldn't you just go ahead and restructure that contract? I don't know. You'd have to talk to to them. I mean, they're probably going to cut some veterans come camp and as they whittle their roster down to 53 with this new new head coach in there, Mike McDonald, replacing Pete Carroll. So they're going to probably create cap space that way. I just don't can't imagine a team's going to trade DK Metcalf because they have to clear cap space and they haven't properly planned for that throughout the offseason. Sure. Structure, sure, but but trading the guy it feels just you know, just a crazy way to try to solve that. Is there more to that story there? I mean, obviously we'd find out after the fact, you know, uh, uh, you know, is, is there, is there a potential that maybe he wants out of there, even though he is, look, there's pictures out there. He showed up to the, uh, they're having some sort of, you know, they're able to start a week or two early, right? Because a new head coach or whatnot. Right. Right. Uh, and there's pictures of him participating. So he's not, he's not being a butt or anything. It doesn't look like, uh, is there just a potential that the team just want to go another direction with him? Is he hollering for more money? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to see both sides of it because the, the biggest question I, you get, and I get when throwing DK Metcalf's name out there is 
Why would they even trade him? And it's a legitimate question that I have no no great answer for. Yeah, we're gonna have to talk to one of our, our Seattle guys. Who do we have on? Greg Greg Bell was he? Yeah, a, we yeah, yeah, we could yeah, we could we could reach out to him. Or I yeah. mean, it can be the podcast or just even DM just to see what his thoughts are, because I've not heard anything that suggests they have a desire to trade DK Metcalf. But maybe right. And, I, and, and all, all the all the all the, all the, all the bloggers that I consider legitimate with, with 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 you know that cover the Seahawks and and their beat right. You know, everybody's saying that there's no way they're going to trade them. You know. Yeah. So. It, what do they do? You said it'd be post June first, and so right. it until has that be, time it, comes. Yeah, it has to be post June first. There's no way around that. Sure. So until that time comes, then I think at this point we're just kind of sitting and waiting. All right. And then the other one, of course, is Sutton and with w- with Denver, and everybody will tell you that he's not for sale either. Yeah, but that one I think has more reasons of why it could happen. Uh, right. Primarily because he seems unhappy with the contract and maybe just the situation at large in Denver, and they're maybe kind of going through a bit of a reloading, rebuilding type of phase. All right, so we're back where we started at. Yes, uh, no progress. Uh, no progress in 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 our twenty minute whatever talk there. Uh, the Steelers could use another wide receiver in that room, and the pickings are slim. Yep, that's that's where things will be until things change. All right, Dave, let's talk about rookie minicamp coming up here. A couple new names known to that tryout list, including one veteran. Interesting name here to discuss from receivers to running backs and Jonathan Ward, former uh, Cardinal and Tennessee Titan, who was with the Titans last year. He's only played sparingly offensively in his career, came out in 2020, but has a good receiving background, did so in college, and a bunch of special teams value as well. 16 career tackles, played heavily on teams, his rookie year and sophomore year in Arizona. I don't believe there's an Arthur Smith uh, overlap there. I think he was in Tennessee. Uh, I think Smith was gone by the time that Ward came into Tennessee. But that's a name that I would not be surprised if he was signed at a rookie minicamp. All right. What does the rest of the uh, Steelers running back depth chart look like right now? Obviously, you got uh, 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 Patterson in the room now. Yeah, your top three, Najee Harris, Jalen Warren, Cordell Patterson, those three feel pretty cemented in their roles. Of course, Harris and Warren, bulk of the carries, Patterson, occasional offensive snaps and, and kick return work behind that. It is relatively thin. You did sign Dejon Edwards from Georgia, the undrafted for agent who's got some vision, some versatility, some pass protection, a little Jalen Warren light, so to speak. After that, there aren't a ton of names out there. There's Aaron Champion who signed a futures contract. And then it kind of gets pretty, pretty thin from there. You got some fullback types, H back types, Connor Hayward, Jack Coletto. So I could certainly see Ward coming in as that, you know, odds of making the 53 are going to be pretty tough, but there's a skill set there with the versatility there, special teams value beyond the return game in terms of coverage ability uh, that I think can be useful. They're going to need some uh, bodies in that room uh, for, for, for camp. Yeah, they could use an extra guy. So I would not. Again, trying to predict a tryout guy based on his performance in that rookie minicamp is really impossible. But if you had to tell me, as of right now, one tryout name who who has, a, I think, a real chance to to get signed with this team having four open roster spots right now, I think Jonathan Ward is that name. All right. Also invited to camp is, uh, oh, I, I want to make sure I get the name right here because I, I had screwed up the the name initially in my head, at least not, not writing about it for the site, but uh, Dow from Dayton, the quarterback. Uh, what is it? Uh, cold, 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 cold out. out. Yeah, I wanted to say like Clayton for some reason. I'm getting the Dayton and Clayton stuff mixed up. But Cold Dow has been invited to Steelers rookie minicamp. Uh, he had played receiver and quarterback at Dayton, played some quarterback in a more kind of part time role last year for the Flyers. I don't know how he'll come in either as a quarterback or a wide receiver with Pittsburgh. We'll have to see where they list them. They already have two quarterbacks. We know we'll be playing quarterback in rookie minicamp in. Uh, Aeneas Dennis from Benedict College as a tryout, and then John Rice Plumley uh, playing quarterback, the undrafted free agent who signed out of Central Florida. So we'll see on that, but that is an additional name, Cole Dow, coming to Pittsburgh. All right, so they got enough arms to work with this con- next coming weekend now. Yeah, it, 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 certainly if Dow plays quarterback, then that's three. Typically, I think they only need two quarterbacks for rookie minicamp, and so I don't know if Dow will be doing much quarterback, but he might. He's a good athlete. Uh, he was at the Northwestern Pro Day, which Mark Sadowski attended. He ran, I think, low four sixes, 38-inch vertical, had a nine RAS, and so there's some athleticism there. He's not, I mean, he, he's not, he not really caught passes in college, and so I don't know what kind of receiving background there really is, maybe some stuff in practice, but... 
Um, not really sure where he came from because the production is super light overall. Maybe an agent knows him or there's some connection to the team potentially, but he's, he'll be uh, one of the trap guys. All right. All right, Dave, uh, Jersey numbers are in. We should, we should have mentioned this. They're official now, and so it's a good time to mention it, although it's been uh, leaked over the last week or so. But the Pittsburgh Steelers officially announcing the Jersey numbers for their rookie class today. And so I'll just kind of run through the draft picks here. Troy Fautanu, number 76. Zach Frazier will keep his 54. He's worn throughout his, his football life. Roman Wilson will switch from number one to number 10. No one gets number one in Pittsburgh. Peyton Wilson, number 41. Mason McCormick, 66, Logan Lee, 74, and Ryan Watts, number 29. So those are the draft picks, the uh, rookie numbers, or the rookie jersey numbers for, for this class. I tell you, you watch uh, you watch that college tape on uh, Mason McCormick, and if there was anyone to maybe wear 66 uh, uh, because of style of college play, it would be him, right? <laughs> With a pulling, yeah, for sure, for sure. So, um, yeah, hey, that, that's notable. That, I, I'm not I'm not big on analyzing jersey numbers, and we all know how they can potentially change. Obviously, uh, uh, Fautano and Frazier are gonna and 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 Roman Wilson. I don't I don't I don't think you're gonna see those uh, change uh, throughout the rest of the offseason uh, process here. Uh, I would imagine that 66 for McCormick would 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 probably stick as well too. Uh, what do you think about inside linebackers wearing numbers in the 40s? Yeah, a little Bob Spillane vibe there with the 41 from Peyton Wilson. Uh, most of these guys have had to change their their numbers. I think Frazier was the only one who got to keep his college number. Uh, Fogtanu had to switch his. Wilson had to, uh, Both Wilsons had to switch theirs. Um, so as long as he plays well, then he can wear whatever number you know, he wants. And Logan Lee now shares 74 with Spencer Anderson, and that's not uncommon because you you know you don't have enough uh, numbers to go around on a 90-man roster. So you'll get into this thing, and you'll have uh, guys with an offensive number and the same number on the defensive side of the ball. So one of those guys, uh, you know, if both even make the 53 man roster, obviously won't be wearing number 74. Uh, Ryan Watts wearing 29. Was there another? There's not another 29 on the roster, is there? Uh, I will double check. I hadn't gotten to the memorize the roster portion. Nope, he's the only one wearing 29. All right. All right. Uh, and any, any other analysis, number analysis? Uh, nope, I think I'm good. There. I do want to mention analysis though on Mason McCormick. I have an article this morning on the site. Uh, just it's a very narrow scope of what I'm analyzing, but I think it's important. You've talked about and you're right about how effective McCormick has been as a puller, and hopefully that will be continued in Pittsburgh despite Arthur Smith running that wide zone system. He'll run some power as well. But the way that you're taught to pull, the way Lyman pulled, there can be different ways. There's a, a skip pull, which is kind of I would call it more old school what McCormick did at South Dakota state in the NFL and in Pittsburgh, you traditionally see more of a square pole where it's just a different, it's different with your footwork. I have the clips in the article that explains things. So obviously for all these linemen, for all these rookies, there's adjustments when you go from college to the NFL, different schemes, different coaches, different styles. There'll be a bunch of things to learn, especially under Pat Meyer. I think it will be kind of an additional learning curve for all these offensive linemen to adjust their footwork. But I think for McCormick, there's going to be maybe, that's a guy that I could see struggle early because there's going to be so much change for him in terms of what he's taught to do differently in the NFL compared to college on top of the overall competition jump going from FCS to the NFL. They did ask him to pull a lot though, period. Yeah, they did. But again, the technique, the footwork is, is different. And so he'll have to kind of unlearn what he did in terms of his steps and technique to, to do the more traditional square pull that Pittsburgh asks its guards to do he sat some people on their butts as well too especially in that uh game against north dakota state i think was one of them that i pulled the clip on there that uh, not only did he sit him down he told him about it afterwards uh on on on, on top of uh, on top of it there but yeah you're right uh there there is a lot of pulling by him a lot of skip pulling uh in in particular so it'll be interesting to see that maturation prog uh process when i watched him with mccormick did you get a a sense he's a great fit for this more zone based scheme. I thought he struggled more in the second level trying to, you know, climb the linebackers where the athleticism that he tested didn't always quite show on tape. It his his RAS does not match what you see on tape. 
Right. So that's a guy. I mean, I, I'm not knocking the pick too much. There's experience, there's size, there's an aggression, there's a mentality that Pittsburgh is looking for. And McCormick certainly fits that. But again, I don't want to, all, all these rookies will take their lumps early, but I think McCormick's a guy that might have a tough, a really especially tough summer for him. Look, if he can get it, what when he gets out there and he, he, he finds a dance partner, he's, he's hard to un, un, unstick from for sure. But, mm-hmm. uh, it, you just don't see the kind of athleticism RAS that you do when, when you actually see him out in space. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it's a little like Jackson powers Johnson where there's some foot speed there. I wouldn't call him a bad athlete, but just trying to work some of the nuances of being able to work to the second level. Like you said, when he connects and sticks the, the strength, the grip strength he has, he's able to finish and latch onto, but trying to hit some of those moving targets. I, I thought on tape was a, more of an issue for him. So you add that, you add the change in your footwork pulling, the overall pass set change, which is probably going to be the toughest part for all these guys to to change. I think Bob Tanya will have an easier time because he's uh, using some of the techniques. And I think Frazier can can adjust well enough to um, just playing at a higher level of competition and uh, the overall experience. McCormick is highly experienced, but I just wonder in terms of the techniques, uh, that's a guy I think is going to have really a tough time initially under Pat Meyer. Can he learn it? Yes. All, all these guys have learned it and gotten better. Think back to Meyer's first year, how much of a mess the line was. I go back to James Daniels, how much he struggled initially coming to Pittsburgh. He improved pretty rapidly throughout the course of the season. So I think McCormick and all these guys are capable of doing that. I just think that's a guy that might have some, some tough reps to start his career. I tell you, the more the more I watch him, the more I get those Richie Incognito vibes. So just, I mean, a guy that look when he gets on you, man. He, I mean, he is a, he's a physical player, and he is a he is a play to the echo of the whistle type player as well. Too, he's uh, uh, he likes everybody to know that he's on the field. Sure, and, and the good news is they don't need McCormick to play right away. He's going to be able to be on the bench, and he'll be a reserve guard to start. That. It's not like counting on this guy to give you snaps from day one. A couple of years ago, that might have been the case. But with your guard settled and Nate Herbig behind as well, you know, McCormick can take some time to learn and refine his technique. And look, as a fourth round draft pick, you would expect him to make the 53, you know? Yeah, very rare for a fourth round pick. I think every fourth round pick last year made the 53. I think actually Darius Rush was the highest draft pick to not make the 53 with Indy. He was a fifth round guy. And then, uh, of course, found his way to Pittsburgh. So there have been there have been occasions where fourth round picks have not made it in Pittsburgh. I think Duran Grant initially was practice squad. Fred Gibson there was another receiver whose mind whose name escapes me right now. But that was early Colbert era. But but you know, odds are he'll make the fifty three. Right, I agree. All right, Dave, uh, where to from here? Do you any any other tape study? I was watching some more Peyton Wilson. What what do you think his best? kind of trait is if you had to pick out one trait on Peyton Wilson, uh, closing speed. Yeah. That's what I was going to go like pursuit closing speed. This guy covers a lot of ground in a hurry. Right. Uh, that's the thing that, of, of, I mean, you, you know, just, uh, the, the handful of the, the inside line off the ball linebackers that I paid the most attention to during the off season that, that were kind of, we felt maybe connected to the, to the Steelers, uh, throughout this process and all, uh, he's the one. And look, I said it right out of shoot with this guy, you know, around senior bowl time, you know, obviously the concerns about, uh, 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 the injury history and all, all of him aside, if there's one thing that, 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 that showed up on his tape is he could still move, man. I mean, and, and the closing speed is very, very evident. Uh, I, I, I think on the tape there. So that, that's one, if there was a, a knock about him, I think just his overall height and the way he kind of tackles high sometimes, uh, is, is probably one of his, the, the thing that he'll have to work on the most is just, you know, trying to get more around the, 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 the midsection as far. Cause I, I think when you see some of his missed tackles, it's him trying to tackle up high. Do you think that's because he's he's a taller linebacker? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Okay, I think that makes sense. Yeah, because I mean, look, you look at just traditionally over the what they look for kind kind of things when it comes to these Steeler linebackers overall. Those guys are normally, you know, five eleven to six one, right? Yeah, there just aren't many linebackers in college football who are six four like him. You just don't right. find that guy too often this day and age. I mean, and that doesn't mean that if you if if you're this 
you know, over this height, you can't ride to ride, you know, mm-hmm. uh, cause there's obviously been good, good linebackers, but it just traditionally o- over, over, you know, uh, the history of the Steelers, that's generally the, the size that you see these guys. What was Shazier? He was like, what, six, what was he? Six, one. See, I, I, I can, I'm checking. I, I'd say it's maybe a, a touch taller, but I know it looks like maybe you're right. Six Oh one, one. So you're, you're on the money with that one. Okay. Uh, I mean, well, once again, it, it, it's a it, we're, you're nitpicking a guy like that, but I mean, you want to you want to say the thing that sticks out the most, and plus he can rush the passer too. I mean, that that, that yeah. that's a, he was asked to do that a lot. Uh, it wasn't. I mean, I'm sure you picked up on this too, and we talked about it right after he was drafted as well too. They moved him around all over the place in that defense. Played a lot of edge. Like I was surprised by the number of actual edge, you know, rush snaps he was playing. Right, and he did well at it too. To be honest with you, yeah. for, for for what he was asked to do, playing out on the edge like that, you know. Uh, but he was a guy that was asked to rush the quarterback quite a bit, and man, they'd move him around. He'd have to run with some receivers down the field and all like that. I think he's got uh, good football awareness as far as zone uh, type responsibilities and all like that. And, uh, look, uh, the the only thing that's going to to me that's going to prevent this guy from 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 you know, having some level of success in the NFL is just, you know, can, can, can he stay healthy? He does feel like this blend of new school and old school because he's a great athlete. He's not, I mean, he, you know, he ran four, four, three, you see the closing speed, the athleticism when he opens it up and runs, there's that clip of him against Notre Dame, right? Hawking down that receiver, which has kind of made the rounds. I found another, I'm going to, I'm going to post both on Twitter. That was against, I think Louisville or some, I think it was Louisville, uh, a similar situation. Not that you're loving making tackles 30 yards downfield, but just his pursuit and his speed when he opens it up is really off the charts. But he's got the old school size too, because back in the day, your linebackers were bigger, taller dudes. Not that he's LeVon Kirkland, but just like him, Jack Lambert was 6'4". You go real old school to Ted Hendricks, who was like 6'6", the Matt Stork. And now at age linebackers are smaller. She said five eleven to six one. They're more compact and the athleticism is what people really look for. He kind of has both. He's got the old school size with the new age and new school athleticism. And that's a I think a really attractive skill set. And look, uh it, you know, I, I, I dare you to find a play on, on on at least the college tape that we have access uh to uh taking a playoff. Yeah, this guy, somebody, I think one of his coaches or an opposing coach used the term relentless. I think that's a perfect word to describe Peyton Wilson's demeanor and play. Right, right. All right, Dave, um, let's see what else we have here. It's it's a topic I certainly do not like talking about too much, but Antonio Brown uh, was making some waves here. He was on Jason Whitlock's podcast yesterday, and I mean, it's, it's nothing groundbreaking, he said. In some respects, it was more positive things he's had to say about his time with Pittsburgh than he's said in past uh, interviews and conversations. He praised Big Ben, called him the best quarterback he's ever played with, and of course, he played with Tom Brady, called Mike Tomlin a father figure. There were some kind of typical A-B weirdness in the interview, but overall, at least there were some positive takeaways from A-B's time in Pittsburgh. Yeah, and he got his feelings hurt about Juju, right? Yeah, I mean, he in the interview, he kind of took some shots at him, but also said that that wasn't the reason why he wanted out. He wasn't mad about the 2018 team MVP vote, although he said that he was in the past. He just said he didn't think he could win in Pittsburgh. Why do you go to the Raiders who weren't winning either? It doesn't really make any sense. So, again, not trying to uh, parse this too carefully, but AB has uh, had an interview that was pretty expansive and touched on a bunch of different topics. Yeah, that's a long interview, two two plus hours on that, and and, and what little bit is is in there that that you know Steelers related. My main takeaway as I went to bed last night after reviewing some of that uh, was more depression than anything. More more of man, I can't believe that team didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. Why? Why didn't well, at least one of those teams win a Super Bowl? You know, sure. You know the defense just wasn't there, and there were the injuries too. You know, Bell was hurt in playoffs, and AB I think had some injury issues as well. So just never came together the way that that you hoped that that it would overall. Um, he, you know, he 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 seems pretty optimistic about his Hall of Fame chances in 2027. He wants to go in with Ben. That was what he uh, had said. That's kind of his plan and his hope. We'll see. I think it will be a really interesting discussion when the time comes about how the voters 
cast their ballots and judge AB's career because obviously you're not just judging his on-field work, which to me is unquestioned for a ballot Hall of Fame status. You're also judging all the baggage that, that he brings. My advice to him would be just lay low, just get out of the public eye for a while, you know, where people aren't talking about what you're doing now and are more focused of reminiscing on what he did when he was on the football field. Uh, to me, and, and this is really has always been the case for several years now, even when he was still playing, was he's his own worst enemy when he when he does start tweeting or talking and all like that. So, you know, it, to me, his best chance of, of getting into the Pro Football Hall of Fame at, 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 <clears throat> at any point would be benefited by him just disappearing. Yeah, I, I, at least I think legally, from my understanding, is that it's been quieter on that front. I mean, he's still tweeting and doing some of those things, but I, I don't know if that's as damaging. I don't think that'll get remembered a couple of years from now when the time comes. Um, well, you see yeah. all the stupid tweets that he's sure. out there. No, that- it's not good. I don't think it's not helping that cause, but it, you know, he's not dealing, he's not as in the spotlight as he was with some of the legal stuff. And of course, when he was playing and storming off the field, those things, I think will be the things that are remembered more so than, you know, whatever he's tweeting these days. Well, I think he'd just be better served just disappearing for a while. Like I said, I, I think, the more focus, uh, if the if, if there's nothing to focus on of what he's tweeting or interviewing about, uh, then you know sure. anytime you th- you know hopefully you'll you, your your mind goes to what he did when he was on the field, particularly the years that he was in Pittsburgh, and you know uh, that that come come back to the forefront in people's minds. No, I agree. I mean that that's. I, I, you know, you'd like for him to be remembered, but obviously everything that's happened since his exit from Pittsburgh has clouded that unbelievable six-year stretch he had of being the most dominant receiver in football. All right. We've got a lot of that stuff written up on the site if people are interested in in in, in reviewing that. Dave, just kind of coming off of our, our initial conversation about where this team is looking to add at receiver, you wrote a post I think yesterday or two days ago about the cash aspect of where Pittsburgh sits. You discussed that quite a bit. You thought maybe they'd be spending more cash. There is more cash to spend this year. Just kind of walk through that. Everybody's favorite part of uh, that's why all those posts that I write about cash do so well. And people (laughs) are so enthralled when I talk about it on the podcast, they just a ton of rave reviews and everybody looks forward to the next time. Uh, They can't wait to get past the the current conversation about cash in the Steelers because they know that's another step closer to the next time that no, I'm I'm kidding there. They're Uh, holding signs outside my house right now. We just, they just say cash on them. So people, Right. Loving it. Right. Loving it. Uh, look, I don't care. I like writing about <laughs> it. I, 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 I'm I, enthralled about tracking cash spending and the predictive measures uh, related to it. And, you know, uh, obviously with the with 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 the draft being over and, you know, having a better look at, you know, what 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 this team's up against about signing their draft picks and the bonuses and the undrafted free agents and what's left and where I project them to go. Uh, I, I come away with. Really, the the main the main takeaway from from this latest update, Alex, is a. I think we both are expecting Pat Farmu to get extended at some point during the off season. Correct. Again, I think you're a bit more confident than I am in that, but it certainly would be the most likely player to be extended now that Najee has had his option declined. All right. Uh, assuming that happens, I've got like a $13 million cash placeholder uh, for him as we sit right now. One piece of the puzzle that's going to be very interesting to watch play out is what, if anything, is done with the Cameron Hayward uh, contract. And if indeed it is an extension, is it going to be a no new additional cash expenditure in 2024? That's the way I am leaning to it going. But obviously, I don't know for sure. Now, if they do something where he does get more cash in 2024 as part of an extension, that 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 that's obviously something that that needs to be accounted for. But uh, when you factor in what these rookies are going to get, what we, what at least I think is going to happen with Friermuth uh, and or Hayward, 
I mean, we've talked. Uh, who else? Who else might get an e- extension this off season? You seem more confident about maybe a, 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 a James Daniels extension than I do, and obviously that would shift the cash spending if something uh, happened there. It wouldn't shift it greatly, but it, it there 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 is there is room both cap wise and cash wise for something like that to happen. So that's another piece of the puzzle here. My main takeaway, uh, uh, once again, that I came out of this is there's like a $13 million hole uh, with what I project this team might ultimately spend as far as cash goes for 2024. And look, uh, my projection of what this team would spend in cash was out there well before all this talk about Maybe adding a a, a, a a a wide receiver via a trade or whatnot might happen. And magically, there's like a $13 million hole that could be filled. And it just so happens to line up with the base salaries that one DK Metcalf uh, and Cortland Sutton are set to earn in, 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 in 2024. So, you know, either take your either 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 put your tinfoil hat on or don't. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, and it's funny to see those numbers align. Is there a chance they just kind of punt on this year and just spend all that money next year? Because it does seem like that 2025 offseason is going to be very active with a bunch of expiring contracts, potential re-signings, the quarterbacks especially. They're going to potentially have to pay one of these quarterbacks should they play well in 2024. Absolutely, there's a chance. Uh, And once again, the hardest part of getting into cash spending for teams Related to the three-year CBA, uh, uh, the the new three-year CBA period that we're in right now, it makes it extremely tough to uh, predict, anticipate what a team is go- going to spend in year one of the three. At least when you, you know, when I started getting more heavily into this, it was last year. You're in the the third and final year, and you got a pretty good idea what a team right. has to spend cash wise because they have to meet certain criteria of the three year period, meaning at least 90% of the three year total of the league's cap number being spent in cash. So it's a, it, it's a lot easier to surmise, okay, well, they're probably going to have to, or they're going to have to spend at least this X amount in cash. They can obviously go over that, but at least you had a better idea of what had previously happened in the in in, 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 in in the previous two years. When you're talking about year one, yeah, look, I mean, you look at what they're projected at right now, at least with this 53-man, uh, top 53 players under contract and the rookies and, and all like that, not counting anything else. They're at roughly 81.7% of, of the 2024 cap number. Uh, you know, could, could, could they come in at, you know, 82, 83% and, and with their plan being in the final two years to make up the rest of that cash spending. Absolutely. We, I, I don't know. And I doubt Omar Khan's going to answer any of my emails <laughs> or my text, uh, 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 about that. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is a, and I, I tried to mention this two or three times during this post d- during, you know, in this post, this is a guess on my part. That, that this team will spend uh, at least $235 million in cash this year. So uh, is that number going to be right on the money? No. I If you're worried about Dave getting something right, you don't have to worry about this because it won't be exactly that number. But, you know, you have a lot of reason to believe that the number will be at least that because even at, 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 at $235 million spend, you know, that's just 92% of, of the league's cap number this year. So could it come in less than that? Could it come in considerably less than that? Yes. But, you know, I like playing with projections. That's what my projection is. And if my projection is even close to being right, there's a $13 million cash hole there. Right, which could be the big splash move that Pittsburgh is searching for. So, yeah, I mean, it's good information. As you said, that that first year is always tough to project because teams can go in a bunch of different directions and make that up in year two and year three. Um, again, I, again, I think Pittsburgh wants to to spend some cash, but I think they're just trying to find a, a, a partner to help them spend that cash, and that's proven difficult. Will they spend more than the 208 208- let's call it 209 million. They are on course to spend right now. 
The answer is yes, right? Yes, it is. But the question is how much more and where does that money go to? Right. Are we Who talking another thirteen million for Pat Firemuth? Are we talking anything different with the you know uh, what are they going to do with the Hayward extension? Uh, is someone else going to get ex- you know? Could, could they something- got to add a slot corner? They got to add somebody at some point. May not be huge money, probably right. won't. But you know, Patrick Peterson. I don't know someone on a one year three million dollar deal, something like that. All right. Being as how this is so such a popular topic. Uh, we'll, we'll end it right there, but, uh, and you know, there's not going to be really much of a reason to update this until something happens sure. significant in a cash spend. So right now we're, uh, I guess the next, uh, line in the sand would be, I guess, June 1st to see if, or June 2nd to see if anything happens with the trade there. And beyond that, I mean, look, there's with the, with the cap space, this team has right now, there's no reason. There's no reason to go out and get anything done with Pat Firemuth unless you're expecting a market, you know, market another uh, another tight end on the market to sign or something like that. I mean, there's no reason to do anything on Pat Firemuth until you get into training camp. There's quite honestly no reason to do anything on Cam Hayward until you get to camp, right? Although Omar has been doing the deals earlier than what Kevin Colbert typically did. I don't know what that always it will apply to every player, but right. we've seen these contracts get done in June well before camp where in Colbert would typically be doing them closer towards the end of camp. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess technically I, and, and look, I mean, nothing, unless you're going to be, unless you have any negotiating going on with Cam Hayward, as far as average yearly value and cash in the first year, there's not much discussion to be had there. It's, it's going to be like, we're going to add a couple of years on here. We're going to turn a bulk of your base salary into a signing bonus. And, and 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 move on there because really the goal here is just lower your cap number and and set up the potential for you to play after 2024 if you if if you and us deem it you know a, a path to go down. I know this is already baked into the numbers, but we probably should be hearing about some draft pick signing soon. You would imagine, correct? Right, and I've already kind of budgeted that sure. in. You know, with, with, because I mean the signing bonuses are you you've got to you you've got. You've got within a few dollars of of of, of knowledge and projection out there of what that would look like, and the right. only the only question is 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 any of these guys going to get hung up with you know negotiation process as far as signing bonus payout and all like that. Right. I, I only mentioned that just to say the next contractual thing right. to come up would probably be that. Again, I know those numbers are slotted and they're baked into the cake of, of your projections, but just in terms of some movement we might see from now until June 1st or 2nd will be just those deals getting signed officially. Yeah, but by when we talk on Monday, there's a, a, a you know better chance than not that both Ryan Watts and Logan Lee will be under contract, probably Mason McCormick too. To be honest with you. Yeah, they typically start doing those deals right around that rookie mini camp right. weekend, right? Kind of get those guys in the door, make sure everyone's got all 10, 10 fingers and toes and then get some deals signed. Right. We, you know, we will be talking about some of these draft picks having signed on Monday. I have a feeling it's just right. a matter of how many of them. Exactly. All right, Dave. Uh, last thing to mention here officially, I, I guess you can call it confirmed. Essentially, it's been reported out by all the media types. The NFL will, will release its 2024 schedule next Wednesday. That's going to be one week from today, May 15th. We know those things typically start getting leaked out a bit earlier the day before. Typically, they mention even official announcement in terms of some marquee games, holiday games, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then the schedule will officially drop 8 p.m. Wednesday. But uh, I think last year we knew the entire schedule before that even occurred in terms in terms of the official release by the team in the NFL. So that is something else on the calendar to watch for. The only thing I got to say about that is I wish it was happening this week just so we could get that part of the process <laughs> of the offseason behind us, really. That, that, that That's all I have to add there. Yeah, I'm not too big into schedule release time. I know it's notable for players, and I'm curious to see what the week one opponent will be. Will Pittsburgh be at home? Will they be stuck on the road as they have been most years until that streak finally mercifully ended in 2023? We'll see. I I, I don't know, but I would imagine Pittsburgh at Denver week one would be a the, the front runner to take place. All right. Uh, shall we get to some reader emails? Yeah, let's get to some reader listener. emails and close out today's show. All right, Nolan McAdams. That's a new name, I think. Uh, got 
pretty lengthy here. Nolan, tighten these up uh, next time. I'll, 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 I don't, we don't have many of them, so I'll try to indulge Nolan here. First, I want to say that your year-round coverage is second to none. My question is about Steelers' long-term plans for the future. Honestly, I was excited about the Justin Fields trade more so than the Russell Wilson signing. Kenny Pickett was not the answer. Uh, blah, blah, blah. That the team found out going into his third year and didn't waste another year. Uh, but now that the picket error is over and boy, was it a whiff drafting him in the first round? When do you see, when do you guys see this team being ready to take another bite of the apple and try, try to find that franchise guy? He says Baltimore has Lamar, uh, and his, uh, one and eight record. He says against the Steelers, the Bengals have Burrow, who is a pretty good quarterback. The Browns sold their soul for Watson. These guys aren't going anywhere anytime soon. He writes, I just hate the idea of another 10 to 15 years of finishing second or third in the division. I realized that the team needed to invest in the offensive line this draft. Uh, they currently have aging players having to try to slide all their chips in on the 2024 season is great. But what about the 2025 season? We saw the Rams and Bucks win a Lombardi and then fade into obscurity. Now that, uh, not now that can be acceptable by the, for those teams because they are not, the Pittsburgh Steelers. He says, Dave, I just want your and Alex's opinion on what comes next because I see next year's draft needing to retool the defense, replacing guys like Cam uh, when, uh, you know, basically he wants to know what, what the plan is kind of moving forward. Uh, Nolan, I, you know, I, I know it's our job to, to, to kind of talk about these things, but I, I gotta be honest with you. I, my, my mind is right now really on 2024 and thinking, man, how can this team upgrade this wide receiver room by one more? And if they do do that, and if these draft picks can come in and, and, and help this year, and based on what we saw out of last year's class, my mind is really all about can this team make a legitimate charge in 2024? Uh, you know, basically, I, you know, we, Alex and I have talked, you know, maybe will something happen with the Justin Fields contract later this offseason? And, and man, all three quarterbacks they have under contract right now, none of them are under contract past the season. So there is some question there. I, my mind is not really drifted much past of what what the hell is going to happen in 2024 alex sure next year is a long long time away in the football world i thought our ross mccorkle though actually touched on this topic yesterday noting that you know from an early thirty thousand foot view some of the potential team needs and strengths of the 2025 draft class projected at least seem to align it's regarded as a good d-line class next year it's really regarded as a, a stronger defensive draft next year as opposed to this year where it was really offensive heavy that might kind of flip in 2025 at least where things stand of course much can and will change over the course of the college football season in 2024 but regarded as a good d-line class good running back clash with pittsburgh move on from Najee harris or perhaps Najee harris moving on from the pittsburgh steelers and so i, I would say d-line is one of those things where you just this team has not made that really heavy investment in replacing or having a, an heir apparent to Cam Hayward. I mean, they, they draft Keanu Benton last year, but he's more in their eyes, nose tackle than defensive end. And they've not really made that other investment the way they invested in Hayward, you know, as Aaron Smith and Brett Kiesel got older uh, late in their careers. And so that, that bill will come due at some point, And that may be in 2025. You, where you sit right now, do you think this, this team and it, it, it's a long way off. Do you think this team invest a top three round pick in a quarterback in 2025 from where you sit it, right now? It, it's such a wild card because it just depends on how this year goes with Wilson and fields. You take this year, you evaluate their play and that really dictates what you do or don't do in the future. Um, again, it's always tough for court for Pittsburgh in some sense to get that quarterback because if you're picking in the, late teens, early mid twenties to get that blue chip guy tough to do again, just based on projections right now, next year's quarterback class is not viewed as favorably as this year's quarterback class. You almost certainly won't see six quarterbacks go top 12 the way that you, that, that you saw it here uh, last month. Short answer. I'll, I'll say no, they will end up finding something with Wilson or fields and, and secure one of those guys. But again, it 
really just depends on their play this year. I, I, I agree with everything you just said there. Nolan, hopefully we indulge you enough. Don't be a stranger. Short these emails up for us a little bit, brother. Uh, let's see. Ryan Roberts, another long one here. Uh, and I don't think, I don't think this is our Ryan Roberts. Uh, Different Ryan Roberts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Steelers had another fantastic uh, and lucky draft. If you ask me with six quarterbacks getting selected in the first 12 picks, uh, so a great tackle fell to them. And then players like Frazier and the two amazing Wilson's pick Wilson picks uh, in the second day, all players, not too many people would have guessed in a million years would fall. He says, heck, Dave had Frazier going in round one. That was a gut feeling, but it was wrong. Uh, Omar Khan and the scouting staff seem like they are killing it. I'm excited for the new year. Uh, he goes on to write here. Uh, I could go back and redo. If I could go back and do one thing this off season, it would be the addition of polarizing Russell Wilson. He, uh, you know, a player that uh, the coach wanted to pay to leave Denver, not pick it up Najee's option or even the picket uh, trade, but letting Deontay Johnson go. He says is one of his biggest irks. Uh, he's a second round pick, blah, blah, blah. Uh, goes on the right. Uh, I, I guess his his big takeaway here. It looks like they were gambling on getting top shelf replacement for Deontay, and it didn't happen. Which makes me wonder if this staff is more lucky than good. And I'm afraid we, when we see Russell Wilson or Justin Fields fail to get the ball consistently to a frustrated double team, George Pickens next year, we will start to realize that this front office didn't really make this roster better. They just got lucky in the draft. So a lot of contention there. It seems like his biggest regret was trading away Deontay. Uh, and not not fully addressing that one extra piece that they lost there uh, to date. That seems like the and he, and he and he thinks the Steelers got lucky with some of these guys falling to him. I, I think it's an interesting and valid point, though. Uh, when I written my winners and losers article on Monday in terms of the veterans that kind of won and lost the offseason for Pittsburgh based on the moves that were or weren't made around them. I put Pickens on the winner's list for the upgraded quarterback playing him now clearly being the number one target in this offense. But there was some uh, debate about was he is he harmed because without another receiver opposite of him, will teams just roll coverage to Pickens all day? Kind of like they did last year when Deontay got hurt in week one with a hamstring pull and it was Pickens and not much else until Deontay return, I think, what after the bye. What is your thought on that, Dave? Is there a concern about Pickens now being so obviously the number one in this offense that defenses will just take him away? I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Today is May the 8th, okay? Uh, let – I'm – we – a month from now will be June the 8th. And okay, I'm following. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Look, they didn't kick me out of uh, uh, a Catholic high school for nothing. All right. <laughs> uh, all I'm saying is, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, May 8th is, or June 8th is one week after June the 1st. See how I figured that stuff out? Mm -hmm. you know? uh, let Let's, re you know, I think it's still a little early to be maybe looking at this. Come get me on June the 8th and ask me these questions. What if they don't make that move? Because, again, they could have the, the strongest desire in the world to go get whoever you want to name. But if the other team says no, there's nothing Pittsburgh can do. Yeah, but are you are you are you making decision? You know, I just. You don't go into this haphazardly, I don't think, with getting without getting enough feelers out. I mean, do you do you honestly construct a plan? Now look, they they've said we're happy with our wide receiver room, yada yada. Uh what was the term Mike Tomlin uh used that we kind of had fun with? Uh I don't recall. Uh right now. not not nervous. I uh I forgot what the what the term he used a couple of weeks ago there sweating or I, I forget what 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 he said but 
you know, they're, they're giving off the appearance they like the wide receiver room. I don't believe it, uh, top to bottom. Uh, and even after 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 the draft, I, I think they know and and knew that the moment that they traded away Deontay Johnson, there there were in addition to the. That's why I thought maybe they draft two wide receivers. To be honest with you, uh, sure. but uh, I my my gut, my heart of hearts believes that they've got a plan here. And now look, if, if how much luck, how much luck is involved? I still think something's going to happen. Damn it. I, you know, I can tell, but I, I think it's also fair to sit there and say, based on where the roster is at currently, if we just assume that's where it's going to be and it could change and it will change in some respects, but it, I think it's fair to say if they, if they can't make that move, it doesn't happen for whatever reason, there is a concern about Pickens getting all the attention now. Yeah. That to me, it's one short. Yeah. So I, you, I think it's, you come out of it one short. Right. I think it's okay to sit there and say, based on how the roster looks, to look at it in its current form. He, here's my my thought on that. I think there is validity to that. I think Pittsburgh's thought will be, if we run the ball so effectively, if we play some of these heavier personnel, we play a lot of 12 personnel, two tight end sets, we're going to force teams to put eight in the box. They're going to have to play single high. They can't play too high. Cause that's how you really take away a guy like Pickens is, typically you're not going to have your free safety who's post safety in the middle of the field. Right rotate all the way over and just have truly nothing in the middle of the field for a tight end or opposite receiver. Typically that those are teams that are playing too high. We've seen more too high cover two in recent years, and they're going to bracket and take away those guys. But if you can pull that safety down into the box, stop the run because a Pittsburgh's run game is so effective and B they're playing more 12 personnel, they're playing bigger people that requires you to match numbers to have an even box count. That's going to create more natural one-on-one opportunities on the outside for George Pickens. And so that will mitigate the risk and impact of him being taken away now still on some third downs obvious pass situations that could be an issue it's valid but i i I think that would be pittsburgh's thought and kind of counter to that concern sure and 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 the moment that 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 this this team added uh arthur smith i mean we we kind of envision you know we have in our heads what this offense is probably going to look like and what it needs to do to be successful right yeah, they're, but they're even so, things. it still feels like this room. Uh, and look, you, you know, is there going to be a lot of eleven personnel that, that that we see on the field? Probably not. Uh, yeah, it'll it'll be less than last year. I think it'll be more than the seventeen percent they ran in Atlanta last year. I think it'll be some sort of middle ground between kind of the eleven personnel heavy team that Pittsburgh was and has been, and the scarcity Atlanta had been. Right, but well, whatever percentage of that eleven personnel ends up being, what is you know, what does that personnel grouping actually look like, and can you be successful with it when you when you need it to be, you know? Sure, and that's to your point about this team really needing that third receiver because it's Wilson Pickens, especially when you got a rookie that you're going to have to bring along and all like that, you know? Sure, Uh, you don't want to put too much on his plate right away. Uh, Look. you know, one of the most con- confounding things right now, I guess, as a whole, when you look back at pre-draft through the draft, is this this team went and restructured the contract of Alex Highsmith, had all that salary, that extra salary cap space there. You kind of wonder, yeah, you know, may- maybe they they freed it up thinking, yeah, we're going to get something done uh, during the draft weekend, and then it all fell apart, you know? I think that was their hope. I, th- I think they've been clearly trying to get something done for a little bit now. I agree. So once again, you know, when 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 June the eighth, let's revisit this and see how much uh, how much has changed, if anything, come 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 June the eighth. You know. Okay, that sounds good. All right, Ryan. Good to hear from you there. Don't be a stranger. Let's see if maybe we can get to uh, one more here. Uh, Brian Tolini. I don't know if we read this the other day or not. Using Alex's fifty-three man roster prediction as a guy. Guide. I only count 19 out of 53 players with Kevin Colbert connections. Do we, do we read this one? We might Maybe have read this did. one on Monday. I Maybe believe we did. It sounds familiar. All right. Yeah. Cause we, we talked about the heavy uh, turnover and all like, and look, <laughs> you gotta, when, 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 when week one of the uh, 2024 season rolls around and you look at that 53 man roster and you look back at the 53 one man roster from week one against San Francisco, it's, it's going to be drastically different. Sure. Uh, big, I think actually we uh, over the cap just put numbers to that that Pittsburgh has among the largest roster 25%. turnover this year. Uh, yeah, was that I forget the exact numbers. I think it's like sixty-two and a half percent of the rosters returning, which is the the fifth 
one of the how I want to phrase this. It's one of the largest turnovers in in football, and two teams that are ahead of them have new head coaches, and so kind of take away the teams that naturally have new regimes where there's natural turnover. I think it's only the Dolphins and maybe the Texans have had more roster turnover of teams with returning regimes. All right, uh, I think we got through everything we need to get through. We managed to crush an hour in about, I don't know, 10, 12, 13 minutes. So we will see what all, let's see. Uh, uh, are we we going to do, we're, we'll do a Friday morning before rookie mini camp gets underway, right? Yeah, Episode. I mean, I, yeah, it will, we you should don't know do how that. much we have to talk about, but. Sure, everything is going to kind of come after we're done on the podcast, but we'll, we'll figure it out. We'll make it work. We'll have a Friday show and, and certainly one on Monday as well. Maybe we'll reach out to, uh, Greg uh, Bell in, in Seattle. Maybe have him on for a segment. Yeah, see, that works. Uh, see what's going on with DK. Uh, all right. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter slash X at Steelers Depot. Follow the great Alex Kazora at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, SteelersDepot.com. Hit the donate button up right, navigational bar. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, SteelersDepot.com. Hit the ad free button. Follow the directions that way. Until Friday, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast. Oh, happy birthday, Bill Cower, uh, no, today. Sure. Uh, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.